Crystalline solids are classified by the kinds of particles found. Some of the categories are subclassified by the kinds of attractive forces holding the particles together. So here are the kinds of crystalline solids. Molecular solids are solids whose composite particles are molecules. So ice, for example, we look at H2O. H2O is a covalent compound because both atoms are nonmetals. So we would call a particle of H2O a molecule and we would call ice a molecular solid because ice is made up of H2O particles, H2O molecules. Ionic solids are solids whose composite particles are ions. So if I have uh, sodium chloride, and I know that's an ionic compound because it has a metal and a nonmetal, then if I'm looking at a solid compound composed of sodium chloride, then that's an ionic solid. So another word for molecular solid would be covalent solid. Atomic solids are solids whose composite particles are atoms, and that means that atomic solids are pure elements. So there are different ways that atoms and pure elements can be arranged, and um, depending on the nature of the interactions between those atoms, we would define them in three different ways. There are non-bonding atomic solids, and those are solids that are held together by dispersion forces. So for example, particles of um, noble gases do not have any opening own any openings in their electron shell they have completely filled electron shells so that means that they have uh, no attraction to each other and the only intermolecular force that's experienced by noble gases is the dispersion force so if I can make a noble gas become solid I'd have to make it very 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 cold and when I do that, then what I would call that a non-bonding atomic solid because those atoms are only held together by dispersion forces. So noble gases are different than metals. Metallic atomic solids are held together by metallic bonds. So because metals, um, if I look at any, any of the metals um, and I look at how many electrons are in their valence shell, so their outermost electron shell, they never have filled outer electron shells. So because they don't have filled outer electron shells, they um, are held together by a bond that's called a metallic bond. So metals kind of get together and share electrons with each other and that holds them together so that they've got those vacancies in their in their valence shell and when they are next to other metal atoms that stabilizes those empty holes in their valence shell. And that kind of bond is called a metallic bond. Um, and there's also a kind of bond that we see between some um, nonmetals. So non-bonding atomic solids are generally noble gases. Metallic solids are generally metals, of which there are a lot. And network covalent atomic solids are those that are non-metals that aren't noble gases. So there aren't very many. We're generally we're talking about uh, carbon here. So um, these atomic solids, remember these are all pure elements. But depending on the kind of element, noble gas, or metal, or non-metal, they're going to be held together differently. Here's a chart that kind of helps us organize these different ideas. Molecular solids are those whose particles are molecules, like H2O. Ionic solids are those whose particles are ions, like sodium chloride. And atomic solids are those whose particles are atoms, so they have to be pure elements. The pure elements that we would call non-bonding atomic solids are noble gases. The pure elements that we would call metallic atomic solids are metals. So network covalent structures are uh, generally those in which every atom is covalently bonded to every other atom. So the reason that ice does not fit this, uh, this description is because the water molecules, the oxygen in one water molecule is only bonded to two other hydrogen atoms. So it's only bonded to the hydrogen atoms that are part of its molecule. Um, if, if we were to consider H2O as a network covalent solid, then that oxygen atom that is bonded to two H atoms would also have to be covalently bonded to two other H atoms. So oxygen would be, bond, would be covalently bonded to four H atoms if it were a no network covalent. So here's kind of, here's an image to show you what I mean. 
this water molecule is stuck to other water molecules. And the nature of this stickiness comes from these hydrogen bonds right here. Remember these hydrogen bonds between oxygen of one molecule and a hydrogen of the other molecule, right? These hydrogen bonds here. So in ice, this oxygen is hydrogen bonded to two hydrogen atoms of neighboring water molecules, and it makes them all stuck together. So in ice, I have water molecules that are stuck together by these bonds. The difference between this molecular solid, where the forces that hold my molecules together are intermolecular forces, and the network covalent solid is that in a network covalent solid every atom is covalently bonded to every other atom. So that would mean that these O's would actually be covalently bonded to the H's and these H's would have to be covalently bonded to other O's. And we know that this is not how water works. I can circle a water molecule, an H2O molecule, and say that these are individual pieces that have covalent bonds in between them. And the forces that hold these water molecules together, this right here where these particles bump up, and this right here where these particles bump together, these are not covalent bonds, these are hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are relatively weak compared to covalent bonds. So it only takes zero degrees Celsius to break these hydrogen bonds to turn ice into water. So again, in molecular solids, we're talking about compounds that are held together by intermolecular forces, just like H2O molecules are held together by hydrogen bonds. So um, those intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole, dispersion forces, Remember, those are generally weak. So that means that molecular solids composed of molecules held together by intermolecular forces have low melting points. Because intermolecular forces are weaker than covalent bonds, intermolecular forces are weaker than ionic bonds, and intermolecular forces are weaker than metallic bonds. So, inter so molecular solids, like ice, have the lowest melting points. Ionic solids generally have higher melting points than molecular solids because the bonds that hold together the particles in an ionic solid are ionic bonds. Every atom, every ion, is ionically bonded to every other ion in a sample of sodium chloride, for example. But when I'm talking about water, the oxygen atom is only covalently bonded to two hydrogen atoms and it's hydrogen bonded to the other two. So ionic bonds are stronger than intermolecular forces. So we say that ionic solids have higher melting points than molecular solids. An ionic solid is like salt like uh, sodium chloride, table salt, where the particles are ions. A molecular solid is like water. The melting point of sodium chloride is about 800 degrees Celsius. The melting point of H2O is zero degrees Celsius. So that's a measurement of the strength of the forces holding those particles together in a solid. Here are some different ionic solids. So when we were looking at um, uh, solid structures before, we were always considering pure elements where every atom was the same as every other atom. They were the same element and the same size. But when I have ionic compounds and uh, covalent compounds for that matter, the elements are not the same. So we can have calcium and fluoride or silicon and oxygen where these atoms are uh, bonded together. Uh, all atoms are bonded, they're all bonded to each other and they're stuck together in a closest packing structure. Uh, 
but they're not the same element. So when I have uh, four fluoride anions, anions are big, cations are small, remember, because anions have a negative charge, have extra electrons, and cations are missing electrons, so generally their radius is smaller. So when I have anions in a crystal lattice structure, and they come together as close as they can, and they leave a hole in the middle, sometimes an ion of another type is the perfect size to fit in that hole. Another fluoride ion would be too big to fit in this hole because these are trying to come together as close as possible. But when they come together as close as possible, sometimes the size of the hole perfectly matches another ion. So that's the case here with calcium and fluoride. We call these lattice holes holes where if the lattice were completely composed of just F minus, there would be these big empty spaces. But if we have other cations that are small, they can fit in those empty spaces. Here's an example, cesium chloride. The chloride anions create a cubic simple structure where they're all um, at the corners of a cube, just like we saw with a simple cubic. When this happens, there's a big hole in the middle Remember, this gave rise to the body-centered cubic structure we saw before. So in this case, if I have chloride anions, then this hole in the middle is big enough to accommodate a cesium cation, because remember, cations are smaller than anions. We call this hole a cubic hole, because it's right in the middle of a cube. And so that means that this cesium is directly in contact with eight of these chlorine atoms. So we can use this information and look at a unit cell here and determine what is the uh, formula of this compound. Because in a unit cell, is going, the unit cell will represent all of the atoms and their ratio for that compound, how many of each atom. So if I look at the unit cell, remember I'm only including one eighth of each of these atoms at the corner. So that gives me one eighth times eight. That gives me one chloride ion, eight times one eighth and inside the cell is one complete cesium cation. So I have 1 8 times 8 is one chloride ion, and one complete cesium atom is one ion. So this is a 1 to 1 ratio. Therefore, the formula is 1 cesium, 1 chloride. Cesium chloride is the formula of this structure. Let's look at sodium chloride. This whole thing right here is the unit cell. This is the smallest repeating structure in sodium chloride. So I can see that in sodium chloride, I have these anions. The chloride takes a face-centered cubic. Ignore the purple ones and just look at the green ones. The green ones are face-centered cubic. And remember, a face-centered cubic has four atoms on average inside the unit cell. It has one-eighth of each corner plus one half of each face, and there's six faces, so that gives me four atoms on average, four chloride ions per unit cell. If we look at the purple sodium ions here, I have one right in the middle, and then I have these other ones here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, that are all around this purple one in the middle, and those these twelve are actually in between uh, two of these cells, whereas the green ones, the corner ones, were only on uh, on the corner, meaning they were only in one eighth of a cell. So the purple ones actually being in this position give, means that there is one quarter of each of them inside the unit cell. This one is split between four different unit cells. So what that means is that I have one sodium in the middle, one, plus 12 sodium atoms that are kind of at each edge here, and uh, a sodium atom at the edge is one quarter of a sodium atom. So one quarter times 12 is three, plus the one in the middle is four. So I have in, in one unit cell of sodium chloride, there are on average four sodium ions. And in one of these, there are on average eight times one eighth of the green ones for one, plus one half times six because it's a face-centered cubic. So that gives me one plus three. So that's a four to four ratio or a one to one ratio. So that means that this is a, uh, that the formula is one sodium, one chloride, NaCl.
So the hole that is in that's left in the middle of a face centered cubic of chlorides the hole that's in the middle of that is called an octahedral hole because if you look at this purple one right here it's coordinated to six green ions and that's an octahedral geometry if we look at this uh, purple one here it's coordinated to eight different atoms here and we call that a cubic geometry so this is a cubic hole a cubic hole an octahedral hole these are tetrahedral holes, and that's because this atom in the hole, in the lattice hole, is directly coordinated to four of the other atoms. You can see the, the yellow or gold uh, sulfide anions here make a face-centered cubic. Again, I've got one at each corner, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, one at each face. So the sulfide ions make a face-centered cubic, and they leave tetrahedral holes. A tetrahedral because this ion coordinates with four other whole ions. So these are just the ways in which different ionic structures, different sized cations, remember cations are small, anions are big, different cations can fit in these holes. We have cubic holes, octahedral holes, tetrahedral holes, this is another one with tetrahedral holes because the uh, cation is um, coordinated to four other ions. Non-bonding atomic solids. Again, these are noble gases in solid form. They are solid and they're held together by very weak dispersion forces, so they have very low melting points. I think I misspoke earlier and I said covalent compounds have the lowest melting points. Well, that's not true noble gases, if we can solidify them, we'd have to get them very cold, they're going to have the lowest melting points because the only forces that hold together noble gases are dispersion forces, very weak dispersion forces. So these tend to arrange atoms in closest pack structure, so generally either hexagonal closest packed or cubic closest packed. Metallic atomic solids are held together by metallic bonds. So remember, because metals have um, holes in their valence shell, they're missing electrons to have a complete shell, that gives them some attractive force to each other, and we call that a metallic bond. Their melting point of metals varies. Obviously we have mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature, and we have some other metals uh, that have very, very high melting points. So the melting point of a metal varies. They also mostly have closest packed arrangements of lattice points. Here are some examples of metallic solids. Nickel, um, we can see here that these atoms are stuck together in a cubic, or excuse me, a hexagonal closest pact. You can tell this is hexagonal because the angle between these atoms right here is 120 degrees. Um, this also is a hexagonal structure because again, we can see this, this angle right here is 120 degrees, so that's gonna give us a hexagonal structure. Remember, we talked about this earlier, but metallic bonding is when uh, two metal atoms share their electrons. So that means that this metal atom is sharing electrons with this metal atom. They pool all of their electrons together in what we call a sea of electrons. So all of the electrons in a sample of metal are kind of free to move around within the metal. That's what gives rise to conductivity within metals. Those electrons are easy to move, and when I move them, I have generated electricity. Uh, a network covalent solid, this is diamond, um, and you can see here in diamond this atom is covalently bonded to this one and this one and this one and this one, and in fact every atom in a, in a sample of diamond, they're all carbon atoms, and every carbon atom in diamond is covalently bonded to every other atom. So this structure right here is incredibly strong. Maybe you've heard that diamond is the hardest substance that we, uh, that we have. Well, actually, that's not true. There are some substances with carbon that are slightly harder. But the fact is that because carbon can make covalent bonds to itself and make this three-dimensional structure of covalent bonds, remember covalent bonds are the strongest. So this is an incredibly strong arrangement of atoms. When I look at this, these atoms are next to each other, but these are not covalent bonds. These are metallic bonds. 
they're pooling their electrons in a sea of electrons. Here, these atoms in this stick right here, those electrons are stuck. Those electrons cannot move. They are stuck right there in that bond. These electrons are stuck right here in this bond. They're shared between atoms and that makes an incredibly strong bond. So in metals, the electrons are not held very tightly and they can move very easily. That makes metals very conductive. In uh, diamond, these electrons are stuck in between these atoms and they cannot move at all because these are incredibly strong bonds. And so because the electrons are stuck in incredibly strong bonds, we say diamond is an insulator, an electrical insulator. It does not conduct electricity. It's very, very hard to get those electrons to move. Another arrangement that carbon can take is uh, graphite, and this is not a three-dimensional arrangement of atoms, they're two-dimensional layers. So in graphite, all of the carbon atoms are bonded together, but they're bonded together in two-dimensional sheets, and those two-dimensional sheets lay on top of each other, and the forces that hold together the sheets are dispersion forces, uh, because carbon and carbon are um, both nonpolar, and so they will have um, dispersion forces that hold the sheets together. So what that means is that these sheets are not held together very tightly at all and so graphite is used as a lubricant because these sheets can slide across each other very easily. So um, graphite has a slippery feel. So to summarize, ice um, covalent solids, molecular solids generally have low melting points because they're held together with intermolecular forces. Ionic solids generally have high melting points because they're held together with ionic bonds. And ionic bonds are much stronger than intermolecular forces. They're much stronger than hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole and dispersion forces. Atomic solids have varying melting points because those that are held together just with dispersion forces have very, very low melting points, the lowest of all, because we're talking about noble gases and it's very difficult to even solidify a noble gas. You have to get close to absolute zero. So they melt, they have a very low melting point, around some of them around two or three or four Kelvin. Metallic atomic solids that are made of pure metal, they have variable melting points, but they're held together by metallic bonds. So remember, if we put the, um, if we remind ourselves how um, the strength of bonds goes, we have covalent bonds are the strongest, and then ionic bonds, and then metallic bonds, and then way, way, way down here, sometimes we'll draw the symbol like this to show that this is not continuous. So way down here, I have H bond, hydrogen bonds, and then dipole dipole and dispersion. So this is the strength of forces that hold particles together. If particles are only held together by dispersion, the weakest force, they're going to have very low melting points. If structures are held together, if particles are held together by dipole and dipole, or excuse me, dipole, dipole and H bond, then they're going to have slightly higher melting points, but still fairly low because these are fair. All of these are fairly weak forces. So the com the solids that are held together with these other intermolecular forces are molecular solids. Molecular solids that are polar will have dipole, dipole and H bonds that hold them together like water. Then when I go way up here, metallic bonds are much stronger than all of these. So me metals generally have higher melting points than uh, molecular solids, although there are exceptions because of the nature of metallic bonds. Ionic bonds are even stronger than metallic bonds, so ionic bonds have generally very high melting points. And covalent bonds are the strongest of all. So if particles are held together by 100% covalent bonds, they'll have the highest melting point. So ice melts at about 273 Kelvin, zero Celsius. Table salt melts at about 1073 Kelvin, about 800 degrees Celsius. Xenon melts at about 40 Kelvin, almost near absolute zero. Gold melts at about 1300 Kelvin. And quartz melts at about 2000 Kelvin. So we can see that based on the nature of the bond that holds the solids together, they have different melting points. Dispersion is the weakest, 
dipole-dipole and hydrogen bond are the next weakest. Uh, metallic and ionic bonds come next, depending on what metal we're talking about. Sometimes the um, metals have higher melting points than ionic solids. And finally, um, network covalent solids are the highest melting points because they're held together by covalent bonds, which are the strongest bonds.